Uh, so we're going to talk about the historical perspective of abnormal psychology today. Uh, we're going to start out with something uh, uh, actually in the 17th century, in the 1600s, uh, people believed that uh, abnormal behavior was caused by uh, demons and witches. Uh, this came from uh, the Dark Ages. The Dark Age, during the Dark Ages, um, religion controlled everything, unfortunately. Or fortunately, I don't know, you can look at it any way you want. Uh, anyway, they, they believed that demons and witches uh, caused all, all problems. So in order to fix something, uh, you had to either exorcise a demon or you needed to get a, rid of a witch. And the, the only way to get rid of a witch, and I'll show you how to get rid of witches in just a second. <laughs> as far as they were concerned. Well, let's start out with the uh, Salem witch trials. There were two little girls. One was, age, one was age nine, and the other was age eleven. And these these two individuals, Betty and Abigail, uh, claimed that they were being possessed by a witch. And as it turned out, the witch that was possessing them was right there in the village. Thank goodness, so that they could do something about it. Well, eventually, of course, eventually they implicated a lot more people. They hung seventeen women and two men. Uh, as witches. They killed 19 people as witches. And it's, it all started with these two little girls. But it didn't end with these two little girls because suddenly after Abigail and Betty were possessed, the other little girls in the, uh, in the, the, uh, the village started being possessed by people as well. And they started implicating other individuals, as interesting as that may seem. Anyway, so what happened next? Um, one girl in her fits and convulsions claimed to see the spectral form of a villager tormenting her, and all she had to do was identify that individual. Well, as it turned out, most of the individuals tormenting these little girls were women from the village, maybe telling them not to do something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, of course, because they implicated these individuals, and because these little girls were so sensitive to this, uh, they found 19 people guilty, and they actually killed, they actually hung 19 people. As interesting as that was. The first person was a black nurse, uh, the only African American in the village. And she was the first one that they uh, implicated. And the reason they implicated her was because she used to talk about when she was in Africa, she, didn't, she wasn't a Christian, she, was, she practiced voodoo. And of course, the imaginations of little girls took off, and uh, they implicated this uh, this nurse. And she was the first one that they hung. But then they hung 16 other women and two, two other men who were somehow getting into their minds. <clears throat> Normally, witches and demon possession would uh, hold weak sway over a population, but Salem was a colony established on religious principles, and demons and witches were not discounted lightly. It was very popular in the uh, 17th, 16th and 17th century. Witches and demons were very popular. As odd as that sounds, you don't think of Christianity as, as having anything at all to do with demons or witches. But the reality was, of course, in the, the 16th and 17th centuries, this was actually very popular. Uh, this was the last time that any witch was hung in the Americas that I'm aware of. Uh, but uh, of course, this became this wasn't uh, popular after the 17th century. Uh, the accusations were accepted by the local medical authorities, and, and more importantly, they were accepted by the religious authorities. So they couldn't have done anything unless the religious people in the town, the the, uh, the preachers in the town, and these people were Puritans, uh, unless they had accepted this, it, it wouldn't have happened. And of course, uh, they did accept it. So the next thing that happened was 19 people were hung. And of course, this is a picture painted about the witch trials. Uh, there's one that was drawn of a, of a lady that is being, uh, is being hung because some little girl felt like she was tormenting her, uh, spectrally, I guess. And there she is, she's fallen on the ground. And the woman is saying, I'm not doing anything. And this little girl, uh, she's raising her hand, so the little girl is raising her hand. She's making the little girl raise her hand. So you become a robot if you, become, if you get possessed. I don't know. 
Because it's, it's just scary stuff. Wait a minute, I got another picture. There we go. Okay. Oh, please, please. Anyway. <clears throat> Ah, 19 people. Okay. Oh, and oh, that's the picture. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Let me let me tell you a quick story. This is Alexandra. Uh, she when she goes to bed at night, instead of sleeping, she ponders the future. She thinks about what's going to happen in the future. I'm sure we all do exactly the same thing: go to bed and ponder the future. She sees only pain and misery for her, her and her daughters. She cries herself to sleep every night and dreams of blood, dismembered bodies. Thunder, decay, death, and destruction. Is this normal or abnormal? <clears throat> normal if it doesn't last long and affect the person. She can't sleep. <laughs> Alexander's thoughts not only encompass her misery, but the impossibility of her life and the doomed status of her daughters. She is afraid to close her eyes, afraid that she will never wake up. One morning, Alexandra can't get out of bed. The thought of facing another day overwhelms her. She wishes that she was dead, and she wishes that her daughters were dead also. She decides to stay home and keep her daughters with her. Normal or abnormal? Abnormal. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> this is Brad. <laughs> he has been hearing mysterious voices that tell him to quit his job, leave his family, and prepare for the incoming and in oncoming invasion. What's going to happen next? Okay. Uh, the voices have brought increasing confusion uh, to that Brad's life. He hears voices. He believes that the voices come from beings from another universe who are somehow wired to him. Normal or abnormal? Abnormal. He hears voices. Is it not normal to hear voices? It depends. From another universe? Is that it? Okay, okay. I was just wondering. Voices or thoughts? I'm sorry? Voices or thoughts? Voices. Voices. Just voices. You hear voices. He's Auditory crazy. hallucinations. He's crazy till the alien show. <laughs> he now has a sense of purpose in his life. Well, at least it gave him a sense of purpose in his life due to his specialness. He's the one that's being communicated with by these these. Uh, alien beings. Uh, but the communications make him tense and anxious, of course. When he refuses the orders he is given, the voices threaten to badger him until he complies. Brad is afraid of being poisoned, so he eats sparingly. Aren't we all afraid of being poisoned? There's uranium in your water. No. <laughs> he has taken an apartment away from everyone and stocked it with food and ammunition. He's, he has guns. He didn't just stop it with ammunition. That would be silly. His family and friends reach out to him, but every day he retreats further and further into his world of mysterious voices and imagined dangers. Normal or abnormal? Abnormal. Everybody agree it's abnormal? Okay. All right. In most cultures, both Brad and Alexandra would be considered psychopathological, uh, maladjusted, emotionally disturbed, or mentally ill. But uh, the scientific field devoted to the study of mental problems is called, of course, abnormal psychology, and that's why you're here. Normal and abnormal are determined by your culture. So it all depends on your culture, whether it's normal or abnormal. So in some cultures, Alexandra would be normal. In this culture, because she's taken the kids out of school, she would be considered abnormal. Okay. She's afraid. She's afraid of what's going to happen next. Abnormal would be an individual deviating from the norms, and that's the norm of the culture. It's an uns uh, the norms are unstated and stated rules for proper conduct of the culture. So your culture has taboos. Your culture tells people how to act. It dictates how people should act. I grew up in a community that was Methodist. It had three churches in the... I've told you this story. It had three churches in, in town. There was an EUB church. There was a... Uh, First Methodist Church, and there was a Wesleyan Church. Well, if you know anything about EUB, it's the German Methodist Church. If you know anything about Wesleyan, it's the precursor for the Methodist Church in the United States. Okay, so we had three churches. They were all different, but they were all actually the same. That's strange. See, so my culture was very Methodist. The culture that I grew up in, or the culture that I was forced to live in, as it were. So that was our that was the, our stated that was our culture. 
And the Methodist Church told us how to act. Uh, Methodists don't pray. We do. Many. I, what am I saying? <laughs> they don't drink. They don't. Uh, they do dance. Uh, they do play music. Uh, Baptists don't dance, and they don't play music. Uh, but these were. The, we were Methodists, or they were Methodists. I grew up in a culture that was Methodist. So does that make me a Methodist? No. Okay. No. Didn't go to church. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it was part of my culture, wasn't it? Okay, so I understand that culture. Uh, a society's norms uh, tend to reflect their history, their values, institutions, habits, skills, technology, and art. The reality is if you wander around the United States, uh, most of the ta little towns in the United States uh, were settled by a group, a select group of individuals. They may have been Germans, they may have been Swedes, they may have been whatever. They may have been somebody, but, and, they, and of course there was only one church. If they were Swedes, they were Lutherans. If they were Germans, they were either Lutherans or Catholics. Uh, and, and on and on and on. So this is the culture that, uh, that supported that town. So if you, if you were not Swedish and you moved to a Swedish town, you didn't have any place to go to church because they're Lutheran. They're, they're all Lutherans, as confusing as that may be. And not only that, but there's not just one kind of Lutheran. There's like ten different types of Lutherans. I know, it's very confusing. As confusing as you can possibly get. Anyway, okay, so if you uh, come from a select society, you have a, you, all of this stuff is, is, uh, is, is intact. You have a history, you have institutions, you have habits, you have skills, you have technology. My daughter is coaching uh, volleyball in, uh, in Clinton, Iowa. Uh, Clinton, Iowa is kind of an interesting place because it's kind of a mix of a lot of different people. But if you go just north of Clinton, there is a town called Fulton, Il Fulton, Illinois. And everybody in Fulton, Illinois is Dutch. They're Dutch. They are Dutch. They even have a, I don't know, it's Quint Windmills. They have a windmill in town. I know. It's weird. If you know anything about the Dutch, they're tall. They're big. <laughs> they got shoulders like this. They're all yellow heads. You know, blondes. It's really kind of weird. So if she will, if she takes her volleyball team to Fulton or any of these other little towns around Fulton, they're all really big kids, and her her girls are not really good. They're not very tall, so they know that they're going to come up against a really tall group of individuals because they're from Fulton. They're not very fat. They're not quick because they're so big. I know it's kind of weird. Anyway, skills, technology, and art. Behavior that breaks legal norms are referred to as criminal. <clears throat> so we do have legal norms. One of them is the speed limit between here and Gallup. And you guys told me I could go 75. <laughs> Am I being set up? <laughs> Going through window rock at 75 miles an hour. I'll see you next time. Next time I drive down there. I'm going to drive down there next week. <clears throat> Behavior thoughts and emotions that break norms of psychological uh, functioning are called abnormal. So if you have ideas or thoughts or behaviors that don't fit what everybody else does. If I live with, uh, if, I, uh, if I'm dealing with a, a faculty, a lot of faculty are obsessive compulsive. They, everything's clean, everything is in the same place. It just drives me crazy. I think they're the ones. <laughs> they're the ones that have to have their desk cleaned up. Not me, my guess is a mess. So I think they're nuts, but they're all that way. So does that make me abnormal, since I'm not like them? I used to work in a department, we had four people, and three of the people, I swear, had Asperger's syndrome. And I'm not one of them, okay? <laughs> this guy right here. They had Asperger's syndrome. They were different. You could, uh, if you talk to them, you had to make sure they were making eye contact because if they weren't making eye contact, they might not hear a word that you said. It was weird. It was really strange. And they would lecture. They would lecture in a monotone, and they would talk like this, and then, and then the lecture was over with, and people would come up and ask them questions, and they would answer questions because they always spoke in a monotone. So weird story. Four people in the department. Three of the people had Asperger's syndrome. There was only one of us that didn't have Asperger's syndrome. Am I abnormal? That was the question. Because they thought there was something wrong with me. 
first of all, I modulate my voice. So it changes from time to time, and they always talked in a monotone, and they thought there was something wrong with me, because I wasn't like them. So it was I abnormal. In that environment, was I abnormal? Yes. Yeah. Am I abnormal in this environment? <laughs> oh, no. But abnormality tends to be situational. Of course, that was a situation where I was abnormal because I didn't have Asperger's syndrome. Alexandra lives in Afghanistan and lost her husband and son to the Taliban before the American invasion. Situation, right? Remember all the things she was afraid of. She was afraid of her daughter, something happening to her daughter. She was afraid of, she saw blood, she saw dismemberment. Well, she did see blood, and she did see, see dismemberment. But she was remembering it, it at night, and that's what scared her. So, uh, is she abnormal or not in that context? In Afghanistan, in a combat situation, in a war-torn situation, is is she abnormal? Mm -hmm. Wanting to keep her daughters at home to protect them. No. Mm -hmm. okay. In the United States, unless you live in Las Vegas, or Detroit, or Detroit, there. <laughs> it's not Detroit. Okay, I've got four, uh, three other scenarios for you. Uh, Julian, Julian is 56 years old. He has just forced himself on a 14-year-old girl. Normal or abnormal? <laughs> Uh, Noki is a 12-year-old. He has just shot three and killed three people. That normal again? Uh, Tilly is fi a 57-year-old. He has been shunned by his family and has wandered into the hills to, to, to starve to death. Normal or abnormal? Right. However, however, what's the situation? I know. What's the situation? 56-year-old Julian has just forced himself on a 14-year-old girl. Julian and, and Mayaj are from India, where marriages are commonly arranged. Uh, Julian was sold Mayaj by her destitute family, and now is exacting his rights from the transaction. These are his rights, his Indian rights, his rights in India. If Mayaj does not accept him, she can be stoned to death. He doesn't want her to be stoned to death, so he forces himself on her. If Julian does not consummate his marriage, he will lose his livelihood because he will be thought of as somewhat, someone who is uh, not traditional and someone who is not masculine enough. So in order for him to survive in that society, he has to have sex with Mayaj so that she doesn't get stoned and so that people don't stop coming into his store. Normal or abnormal? Normal. Normal. Okay. Okay. So it's situational, right? So it really all depends. <clears throat> so when you're talking to somebody, theoretically we're all going to become counselors. If we all do become counselors, and you're talking to somebody, you really need to understand their context, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Okay. So you need to understand who they are. Uh, Noki, he just shot uh, three people, shot and killed three people. Noki is a member of the Angolan Liberation Army and was drafted to be a soldier at age 10. <clears throat> His choice was to be a soldier or to work himself to death in a diamond mine, and of course soldiers shoot people and that's what he did. Normal or abnormal? These are the child soldiers of Africa. Normal? Normal there. Normal there. Yeah, it wouldn't be normal here. However, what happened yesterday? In Kentucky, a 15-year-old brought a gun to school and shot two other, shot and killed two other 15-year-olds. He also shot 15 other people, 17 other people. He killed two, two other 15-year-olds. Normal or ethnic? <laughs> Criminal. Uh, day before yesterday, a kid in Italy, Texas, uh, brought a gun to school and shot a girl and killed her. All kinds of crazy things are happening. We hope that's abnormal. I hope that's abnormal. In the United States, we don't do that. Or, well, we try not to anyway. Africa, maybe. 57-year-old <laughs> Tilly has just been shunned by his family and has wandered off into the hills to wait a, uh, wait a slow death. Uh, Niger is uh, suffering from famine and Tilly can no longer work. And if he can't any longer work and he keeps eating the food, his whole family will starve to death. So rather than sacrifice his family, he's going to sacrifice himself. So he wanders off into the 
Is that normal or abnormal? It's sad, but is it normal or abnormal? Of course, normal. Yeah, it would be normal. He's sacrificing himself. So it's all situational, isn't it? It's abnormal. You don't think it would be abnormal even in Africa? Abnormal. Abnormal. Ab abnormal. I'm sorry. I, I thought you said abnormal. <laughs> admirable. Thank you so much. Yes, you're, you are quite correct. It is admirable. To sacrifice yourself for your family. Exactly. <clears throat> According to some psychologists, only behaviors, ideas, and emotions can cause distress. Uh, it can be, la can be labeled as abnormal. It has to do all those things. However, distress isn't always necessary for behavior, ideas, or emotions to be considered abnormal. You don't have to have distress. There are no circumstances where Brad's communication with beings that don't exist would be considered normal. Or is it? Can you think of any time when Brad hearing, well, as you said, it, as soon as the aliens come, then everybody's going to go, oh, Brad, you were right all along. <laughs> yes, maybe. Are there any other circumstances where you hear voices from things that don't exist? You got a whole area in Mexico <clears throat> called SETI. Okay. All these educated scientists and astronauts, they're doing, trying to do the same thing. Is that right? SETI. SETI. Search for extraterrestrial life. Search for extraterrestrial uh, life. Intelligence. 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 Yeah. Intelligence. Exactly. Okay, so they are listening for it. So but they, they believe have, that there's... They have those big things, though, to hear. So both, both him and that group of people, educated scientists, <laughs> both believe there's aliens. There's aliens. And they both believe they're communicating. They don't hear it, and he does. That's they, the they, they get some hits, some things, sometimes. Voices? They get radio waves. Okay. But the, do they understand what they're saying? He does. He's ahead of them. There we go. Seti, that's a good point. Seti. Is there any other time, other than Seti and, okay, is there any other time that, uh, that hearing voices will be normal? Let's not talk about, well, let's do, do talk about religion. How about voodoo? They hear voices. That's one of the reasons why they go into their trances and whatnot. They, uh, they, they do hear, hear voices. I don't know if it's extraterrestrials uh, telling them what to do. Whether I, I don't know if, if they're telling them to accumulate uh, food and ammunition, but uh, anyway. Uh, dysfunction, abnormal behavior tends to be dysfunctional. It interferes with your daily functioning. That's what dysfunction means. Dys means bad and function means well, function. So bad functioning. Uh, so if it's dysfunctional, it, it interferes with what's going on. Uh, they are so distracted or confused by their inability to, to function normally, they cannot take part in, in an ordinary social relationship or work productively. And that is a dysfunction. And if somebody is dysfunctional, if they can't function in society, then maybe they have a problem. Potentially, it's, and that is abnormal. The idea is that we should all be able to function in society. That we should all be able to go out and work. Of course, there is a point where you can't go out and work anymore. You're too old. Or you can't find a job or whatever. Whatever the reason. But a dysfunction is an, is a, an individual that uh, cannot work because there's something going on in their life that won't allow them to, uh, to function. Uh, the, one of the other problems is danger. If you remember, uh, they're a danger to either themselves or somebody else. Uh, people are considered abnormal if they present a danger to themselves or others. Uh, however, research shows that people who are dangerous either to themselves or to others are the exception rather than the norm. And this is one of the reasons why when something happens, <coughs> like the shooting in Las Vegas or the shooting in, just north of uh, San Antonio or the uh, sh school shooting in, in Kentucky or the shooting in Texas, why we assume that that is, is, is an exception rather than the norm. Otherwise, we'd lock down all the schools and we'd check everybody for a gun. And actually, there are schools that do that. Do, they, do any schools around here do that? You have a metal detector going into school, and you can't bring a knife or a gun. Of course, the uh, Secretary of Education is suggesting that we allow children to be armed so that they can shoot the bears. That's what she said. <laughs> she wants people to be able to shoot the bears. 
Um, okay, so this isn't, isn't all that common, and that's one of the reasons why you send your children to school every day, and you really don't worry about somebody bringing in a gun. It doesn't happen all that often. However, didn't it happen over the holidays? Somebody brought a gun into As the school in Aztec? Did they kill anybody? Yes. Two kids? No. No, that's Aztec. Okay. But that's not happening here, right? My sister used to live in Chicago. My sister, yeah, she lives in Springfield, Illinois now. But she used to uh, live in Chicago, and her, one of her jobs was uh, she was the individual that patted down girls uh, after they came through the metal detector if they fired it off. They, you know, she was the one that patted them down. Usually it was an underwire bra that, that uh, had triggered the thing to fire. My poor sister, you got to feel sorry for her because you can imagine what people were saying to her as she was feeling up all these young, young girls. It was kind of sad. I know. People picked on her all the time. Really kind of tragic. But somebody had to do it. You didn't want somebody bringing a gun or a knife into school. So she had to do it. One of the things that they were doing at that school, if uh, a drug dealer, a male, if a, a male had a girlfriend, then uh, he would give her his weapon uh, to carry for him throughout the day. So she would have a gun or a knife or something, uh, whatever. Uh, and, and this was happening until they started patting down the girls. And that's why my sister got to do that. Uh, before, she was just passing uh, bags through the, the metal detector. That's all she was doing. It's just like at the airport. Mm -hmm. And this was a high school. It's how it is basketball games, too. Uh, high school basketball games. They have, they have metal detectors yeah. and you have to walk through them. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to a basketball game next Thursday in mm -hmm. Indiana. And uh, we'll see if I get patted down. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> I'm not going to shoot. You. I don't. Have, I, I don't have a gun. Okay. Don't take a gun. I'm okay. I'm, I'm probably all right. But I have my keys. I'll try. I'll try not to shoot. I'll try not to shoot. You. <laughs> like I care who wins the basketball. I mean, really. I haven't been to high school in 50 years. Literally, in 50 years. <laughs> Uh, most people struggling with anxiety, depression, and even bizarre thinking patterns pose no immediate danger to themselves or to others. So if you are counseling people, and you're talking to somebody, and they're depressed, and they have, or they have bizarre behavior, the probability of them being dangerous to themselves or, or to you is fairly remote. It does happen, and you have to be aware of that. I don't detect any danger in this room. I... So I'm sorry. I'm in the military. I was in the military, and I, this is one of the things that happens to me every time I'm around people. I try to see danger. I was in uh, a little Cracker Barrel the other day. Well, it was, it was last summer. I was in Cracker Barrel. I was headed back to Indiana or to Iowa. I was headed back to Iowa, and I was in Cracker Barrel. And this guy was sitting in front of me, and he, all, all my alarms went off. <clears throat> Nothing happened. There was nothing wrong with it. It just looked more dangerous than I was used to. And so I watched him the entire time. I thought I was stalking him. <laughs> I was madly in love with him. <laughs> However, I mean, he, he, my alarms went off. And it could have been that there was a problem. I told you about the kid that um, I was, uh, first year I was working in Asheville. Uh, I got a really bad vibe this one day. There was something wrong. Something was wrong, and I knew that there was something wrong. There was a broken electric guitar out in the quad, and I just I could feel there was something wrong. And it turned out that the uh, electric guitar had been broken by a kid that had decided to commit suicide. And so I told security that, that, I, that there was something wrong and that there, this guitar shouldn't be out there. And they said, you know, I, I felt the same thing. I, the security guy was a friend of the Air Force. Guy. The, other, the other security guy is a Marine. He's something wrong with that guy. The head of security was an Air Force guy. And he said, you know, I felt the same thing. And the Marine said, you know, I saw, when I saw that guitar, I felt the same thing. So they started checking the place out. They found the guy. Uh, but I, well, I told you the story. 
he had, he had taken drug, he had taken an overdose, uh, and he had collapsed, both with his head down, uh, aimed head down, and so all the, you know, everything ran into his head. Anyway, he, he actually was able to kill, kill himself. But we knew that there was something wrong. Even though that we didn't see anybody, we didn't see anything, what we saw was that broken guitar. And there was something going on. Uh, what it ha and the, the squirrel, there weren't any squirrels in the trees, and the birds weren't singing. Was it because he was going to commit suicide? No, he'd been out in the quad playing that stupid electric guitar. I don't know if you've ever heard of an electric guitar that's not plugged in, but it sounds really nasty. Anyway, he'd been doing that, and he scared all the squirrels and the birds away. So that was that is what was going on. And so we were right, but we had a feeling. So usually you can tell there's something going on. I don't know what was going on with that guy that I saw at the Cracker Barrel. <laughs> Evidently, I'm madly in love with him. It's not my fault. So to understand new phenomena, we need to apply ideas that are useful in, in another familiar d domain. As a science pr progresses, it moves through a series of models or paradigms about how its uh, subject matter should be viewed. A paradigm provides the following. It provides framework. It provides vocabulary to discuss and it provides a recipe to conduct research. And these are referred to as paradigms. We have paradigms in abnormal psychology. And we, what we use in, in abnormal psychology is what Sarah has taught everyone that has been in research methods. It's the scientific method. And that is our paradigm. <clears throat> uh, mature sciences like physics have moved through a series of paradigms, each one more powerful than, than its predecessor. Psychology doesn't really have any strong theoretical paradigms. Uh, if you put two, any two psychologists in a room, they will argue about theory. That's what they'll argue with. Sarah and I argue about theory. And sometimes we disagree about theory as well. Uh, she has one idea and I have another idea. I've been trained one way, she's been trained another way. So when we get in a room together, we argue. As sad as that seems, <laughs> which is fine. We we both want the best for you guys. That's that's the reason we argue. That's the reason we we theorize. We want the best. Okay. And I want to win. Damn it, no. If you've ever tried to argue with Sarah, you never win. I, I never won an argument with Sarah. Uh, competing viewpoints, but the, the, this is this is good. I mean, it's good because there are a lot of different ideas about this. So it, it's, a good, it's good that we have conversations. It's good that we have dialogue, that we can actually talk to each other. Remember those three guys I was tell, telling you about, the ones with Asperger's syndrome? Couldn't argue with them. Half the time they weren't listening to you anyway. They just look away. And as soon as they looked away, they weren't hearing a word that you said. It was really frustrating. Uh, competing v uh, viewpoints exist in psychology. Each viewpoint offers a different model or metaphor to explain observations and predict events. Uh, we started out with Freud. And we've gone with uh, just tons of different theories. Uh, Alport has a theory. Beck has a theory. I mean, they're just tons of them. Skinner. Uh, you can, and you can adhere to any of these theories that you want. And sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. I am an eclectic scholar. Uh, and since I'm eclectic, that means that I adhere to a lot of different theories, which makes other people say, well, there's something wrong with you because you don't know what the right answer is. And the answer is, they're right. I don't know what the right answer is. And I don't think their answer is right either. <laughs> so this gets really interesting. It sounds like we can't agree on anything. And the reality is, we agree that we need to educate you guys. And the point is, you should come up with your own, with your own type of psychology. You are a different culture. You don't, you're not from the same culture as Sarah and I. She's Canadian, I'm from Indiana. So why in the world would my psychology be the same as yours? You have your own beliefs, and they're different from mine. So you should be coming up with your own theories, your own psychology. Why doesn't, why doesn't uh, uh, the Navajo culture have its own psychology? Nobody's done it yet. So it may be right here in this room. 
whatever your theory, whatever your cult, whatever your culture dictates to you, it may be here in this room. Not with me, of course. I'm Belagana, and I've <laughs> learned all kinds of stupid stuff from other from other theories. Most of it's German. A lot of it's German. Some of it's from uh, the Midwest. Uh, uh, Rogers was from, from around Chicago. Skinner's from up around Chicago. Um, Beck's from uh, Rhode Island. So you know that's where that's where all these theories come from. You guys need to come up with your own theory. So I'm challenging you today to, to go ahead and do that. The hardest thing in the world is to write a theory. I know, it's, it's tough. Uh, okay, anyway. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at psychology and how we have seen things in the past. Uh, in the be beginning, of course, we were controlled by... It, psychology started as a philosophy, not as a science. It started as a philosophy, <coughs> as an idea. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why there are a lot of people that don't like Freud. Uh, I, I was uh, connected to the University of Montana. Mon the University of Montana doesn't even mention Freud's name. Because when he wrote his theory, it was, more, it was all philosoph philosophical. It was all theory. He couldn't prove anything. And he didn't try to. But he was the first one to come up with these ideas. Before Freud, before psychology, before the philosophy of psychology, the church controlled everything. They, church, they controlled all thought. And their idea was that it was all demonology, it was all demonology, spirit possession and witchcraft. So the church, even to this day, if you've ever seen the exorcist, even to this day they try to exorcise demons. There are Catholic priests that that is their specialty. and They wander around the world trying to exorcise demons. It's not just in the movies. This is real. Uh, the next thing that happened was that doctors got a hold of this whole idea that the mind could change what the, the body was doing. The mind could change how the body felt. So doctors came up with this concept. Freud was a doctor. Al uh, uh, Adler. Adler was a doctor. All these people were doctors. All the first psychologists were actually doctors. And from that became the medical model. This idea that there is an organic reason for things to happen. <clears throat> that there's something wrong with them. There's a, a, a lesion in their brains. There's a bacteria that's causing the problem. Uh, so they were always looking for an organic reason for something to happen. And now we know, of course, there is an imbalance of neurotransmitters. So potentially, they're kind of right. We can fix you by giving you a pill that changes the chemical structure of your body. It increases the amount of serotonin. You used to be depressed. Now we increase your serotonin level, and you're not depressed anymore. <coughs> you used to be anxious, so anxious you couldn't leave your house. But now we're giving you a medication that increases your GABA level, your gamma immunobutyric acid level, and now you're not, you're not anxious anymore. So we can actually change things. We can fix you with a, with a pill. It's exciting, or not. But there are some things we can't fix. Schizophrenia, we can make you more normal than you are usually. But we can't fix you. We can't make you not schizophrenic. We can act, make you act less schizophrenic, but we can't fix you. Isn't this exciting? Some things we can't fix, I'm sorry. Obsessive, obsessive compulsive disorder is tough. Yes. I was saying not yet. I'm sorry? I was just saying, not yet. Not yet, not yet. Well, yeah, maybe in the future, maybe <clears throat> something. Who knows? I'm not going to come up with it. I'm too old. When I'm 70, I'm going <laughs> to take my social security. <laughs> I'll still be here, by the way. I'm not leaving unless my wife won't let me come back. <laughs> if she takes my keys away, it won't let me come back. Maybe I'll... I've got a set of my own. These are mine, damn it. She's got her own keys. Psychological view, uh, this is what happened. So initially it was the church that ran things, uh, then it was doctors that, uh, that influenced psychology, and uh, since then, of course, we have developed the field of psychology, and now psychologists are coming up with their own ideas. And that's what I want you guys to do. You guys are, are going to become psychologists, and you need to deal with this population, because this population isn't the same. The traditions aren't the same. The culture's not the same. 
and maybe if you can start a, uh, if, you, if you can come up with a theory that helps here on this reservation, maybe it's applicable to other reservations. Maybe other indigenous people are similar to the people of the Dina Top. <laughs> maybe the Northern Plains people, maybe you'll help them. You never know. Because it is a theory that deals with indigenous people. And maybe, of course, none of you guys are the same, and I understand that, but maybe it'll help because it's not Western psychology. I don't know. I have no idea. Once upon a time, in order to help people, we used to drill holes in their heads. Now you would think, oh, geez, this is, sounds like something stupid that's. <clears throat> Damn, a European came up with it. No, it didn't. we didn't start it. It started in Egypt. Now, unless there was communication between the Americas and Africa, you guys did it too. This is actually a skull from South America. And if you look at the skull, really kind of fascinating, if you look at the skull, it's, he's got three trephination holes in, in his head. This one's almost completely healed. This one is starting to heal. And this is a brand new one. So here's an individual that has had three holes drilled in his head. And evidently, he had three holes drilled in his head for an, for an extended length of time because one of them almost healed over. So we know that, uh, that it didn't kill people. And this is uh, one of the oldest practices. I don't. Were they, were they uh, relieving the pressure in the brain? Were they trying to get demons to escape? I don't know. We don't know because we don't have any writing. So we're, we're not exactly sure. But it happened in Egypt. The Egyptians used to do it. It happened in the Americas, especially South America. The, this, is, this is a skull from South America. So it was happening here. People got the idea if we drill a hole in their head, maybe they'll start acting not better or something. And that's known as trephination, drilling a hole in their head. Now, I've been in on, on uh, this type, not trephination, of course, but I've been in on, on surgery. <laughs> surgery. <laughs> I don't have any holes in my head. My head doesn't look like a bowling ball. But uh, I've been in on these surgeries, and uh, this is, it was very difficult to do any uh, surgery to, with the brain without killing someone. I know, but here there were people that were drilling holes in people's heads in Egypt, in Europe, but, uh, and in the Americas, and they weren't killing people. Yet, m even modern medicine has a difficult time cutting into somebody's skull. Or they did. They don't anymore. They, they, can do, they do it rel relatively routinely. But back in the 50s and 60s, you know, if you went into somebody's brain, the probability of them surviving was, was relatively low. <clears throat> but now, of course, we can do it. Trephination is a piercing of the skull, presumably to release evil spirits, but possibly to relieve really pressure on the brain. We don't know why they were doing it. Maybe they are far more sophisticated than we think they were. The, the, the reality is that we don't know how they put together Stonehenge. And that was several thousand years ago. We, it took us forever to figure out how in the world they built the, the pyramid. But the ancient Egyptians did it. Uh, the Inca put together buildings that we still can't tear apart. And we don't know. Modern science can't explain these things. But they were able to do it you know, thousands of years ago. Uh, this was practiced in North and South America and pre-Columbian uh, as well as in Europe, of course. So it, it isn't just the Europeans. Uh, as far as buildings are concerned, uh, Inca, the Inca buildings were far more far superior to anything the Europeans were throwing together, because they were throwing things together. But the Inca, those buildings are still up, still there. I was there in 2003, and those buildings are still there. If there's an er earthquake, those buildings don't fall down. But the, the European buildings, the ones that we build today, are just crumbling down into to dust. But the, the buildings the Inca built are still intact. In Greek and Roman times, Europeans thought that emotions were controlled by four fluids circulating in the body. If you had an imbalance of these fluids, you needed 25% yellow bile, 25% black bile, 25% red 
red blood and 25% green phlegm, and then you were okay. But if there was an imbalance of any of the fluids, if you had more yellow bile than you need needed, then it made you frenzied, it made you manic, it made you violent. If you had too much yellow bile. If you had too much black bile, it made you depressed. So if you had 30% rather than 25%, then you were depressed. If you had red blood, then it made you a passionate person. And if you had too much green phlegm, it made you grouchy. Now this explains a lot of different things. So if you have an exceedingly grouchy guy, and there are these people that do exist, uh, if there was somebody that's extremely, extremely grouchy all the time, then evidently he's got too much green phlegm. If you've got a young lady that is very friendly all the time, then potentially she's got too much red blood. And that's the way it works. If you have somebody that's depressed, then obviously they have too much black bile. Anyway, this, this is what the Greeks and the Romans thought. Uh, during the Middle Ages, there was a return to the idea that demons caused mental illness as well as war, urban squalor, and plagues. And the other people that they, or the other things that they blamed other than demons were Jewish people. That makes sense. So it's either a bad something, I don't know what is a demon, a spirit, it's a bad spirit, or it's a bad person that you don't like, that worships a god that you don't believe in. Isn't that horrible? So if they had a problem like a plague or a war or, or uh, uh, urban squalor, if there were a lot of poor people in town, guess who got blamed? Well, if there are any Jews around, obviously it's their fault. Obviously it's their fault. And if there weren't any Jews around, then maybe it was a demon's fault. Whole villages would break into frenzied behavior uh, brought on by the fear of possession. Whole groups of people would begin dancing and spasming on the ground in what was called St. Vitus dance or tarantism. They, they would get on their backs and they would wiggle their arms and legs like spiders. <laughs> I know. Now this is really weird, but in the military, <laughs> if they have a dining in, somebody calls dead bug, everybody has to lay on the floor and wave their arms and legs around. Dead cockroach. <laughs> dead bug. Oh, did you guys do dead, uh, I dead cockroach? I don't know. It seems stupid to me. And when I was at a dining inn, I didn't do that, of course. And if you don't, you're supposed to go and drink from your blood bottle, which is a toilet filled with alcohol. Or pay a fine. Or, or, or pay a fine, and I paid the fine. I, I don't drink, so. And I thought it was stupid. All these pilots on the, on the ground wiggling their arms and legs. My wife is on the ground wiggling her arms and legs so that she doesn't have to go to the grog bowl. And then they tried to make her go to the grog bowl because I wouldn't go because I thought it was stupid. Um, and uh, eventually they, they took the fine. They, they, they accepted the fine. I almost got my wife in trouble. <laughs> it's a toilet, okay? <laughs> Or a bedpan. They'll use a bedpan sometimes. Drinking out of a bedpan, that sounds interesting. Some of these people believe that they had been bitten by the wolf spider or the tarantula, and that's one of the reasons why they did all these frenzied things. As, or they were being possessed by demons. In Europe, because of the strength of the church and the political climate, uh, mental illness was viewed as a possession by demons. Uh, various methods were uh, used to exorcise the demons, and I have several of them right now. It all depended on how much money you had. If you had money and could pay for an exorcism, then they would take you into the church, and they would pray over you. <clears throat> but what happened if you didn't have enough money to pay for an exorcism? Well, they still got the demon out. Don't worry, they still got the demon out. They would take you, and they would... They would tie a rope to you, and they would drag you underneath a bridge. And sometimes the bridges were really long. If you sank, it meant that you weren't possessed by a demon. If you floated because the demon didn't want to die, uh, if you floated, then you were, they knew that you had a demon in you. Now remember, you don't have enough money to pay for an exorcism. So how did they get the, the, uh, the demon out? They got... They got the demon out by killing the person. And of course, you can't just kill a person, you have to cook them. 
And that's what they did. They burned him, they burned him at the stake. So if you didn't have enough money to pay the entrances, the next <laughs> <laughs> they, they burned you with the stake. Isn't this a tragedy? So only wealthy people were able to get rid of demons in the, in the, the living way. Okay, but as you can see, this lady not didn't just have one demon. She had a, a pig, a goat, and a bull. That's your demons. Isn't that cool? I know. That's my favorite picture of all times. Lycanthropy be, uh, became common during the Middle Ages. Uh, lycanthropy means uh, possessed by a, uh, or you turn into a wolf. Uh, people thought that uh, unwanted passions were brought to them through the possession of a wolf or other animal. In other words, if you fell in love with the wrong person, guess what? It's not your fault. Don't worry, you're, you're being possessed by a wolf. And the wolf is making you have these, these uh, uh, improper uh, ideas. Okay. So, my improper idea, I, was it in here that I had Britney Spears up there? <laughs> I keep imagining her with the same head. I'm sorry. <laughs> obviously, I've been bitten by a wolf. I mean, obviously. Some individuals would actually imagine fur growing all over their bodies and their teeth becoming razor sharp. As a werewolf, uh, the individual did not have to uh, feel guilt, guilty about unwanted thoughts. Uh, it was the wolf that made them uh, think their impure thoughts. So if you have impure thoughts, of course, obviously, you've been bitten by a wolf. And now you're the American werewolf of London or something. A great movie that I saw last week. <laughs> uh, during the Renaissance, the large monasteries that had been set aside by the church for the housing and the treatment of mentally ill uh, more and more frequently became under the control of the state or the monarchy. One of the things that happened was that the church became extremely powerful. Uh, people were giving land to the, uh, they were dying and giving their land to the uh, church because if they gave money or land to the church, this is a good deal, uh, they went to heaven. I know, how do you go to heaven? Well, you give all your money and your land to the church. And if you didn't have enough money, what did, so what did you do? You gave your children to the church. And then they became serfs, farming the, uh, the, the uh, property of the church. And the church started gaining all of this land, all this property, and all these people were under the church. <clears throat> so what do you do with them? Well, the one thing you do with them is you make them build you a, a, a house. I know, let's have them build a cathedral. So they had all this slave labor that was building all these fabulous cathedrals all over, uh, all over Europe. But the monarchy got pissed <clears throat> because they were, pretty soon the church was more powerful than the aristocracy was. So the aristocracy decided, you know, either you're going to give us part of this or we're going to kick you out. And the country that started that was England because England, uh, Henry VIII, you remember Henry VIII, he had all those wives, couldn't uh, get anybody pregnant with a male child, uh, so he, he kept uh, beheading his, his current wife and marrying somebody else so that he would have a male child. He never did. He had two female children. One was Elizabeth and the other was Mary. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. But in order for him to divorce all of these women uh, or execute them, he had to dump the Catholic Church. They wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't absolve him. So he had to dump the Catholic Church and he started his own church. And after he did that, of course, the other monarchies in, uh, in Europe started threatening the church. And, well, we're just going to kick you off and confiscate all your property. And that's exactly what Henry did. He confiscated all the Catholic Church properties. As interesting as that is, that's just history. It doesn't have anything to do with psychology. But, <laughs> but what was happening was that the church had all of these, not only did they have all these kids that they used as slave labor, <clears throat> but they were also the ones that were given the criminals. They were the ones that captured people and put them, and they had to do something with them, so they put them in these monasteries. And they started taking the people that acted abnormally, and they put them in these monasteries. Well, pretty soon, the uh, monarch is, monarchy is going, hey, you know, give, you need to give up some of your land. So guess which land they gave up? the ones with the asylums on them with all the wacko people and all the criminals on them. So the monarchy suddenly uh, got uh, con uh, control of all of these, uh, of all of these asylums. 
So the, it was the state that was in charge of this stuff. Now before, uh, only the, uh, er, the, uh, the priesthood, in, any, any religious person, uh, could go to this, uh, this place. But if you weren't religious, uh, or if you weren't part of the, the priesthood, then you couldn't visit these places. If you weren't a nun, you couldn't visit these places. If you weren't a monk, you couldn't visit these places. You, could, you had to be one, either a monk, a nun, or a priest in order to visit these places. So when the monarchy took, took over, they decided, they decided that they were going to make money off of it. So they allowed people to come and observe the crazy people or the criminals. And they were all chained to the wall, and most of them were naked, and they had, of course, they didn't have those in the toilets. So they're just, you know, they're messing all over the world. Yeah. So, and they thought this was great. They just had a great time. Uh, and this is what it looked like. If you could see this, uh, these are the individuals that are chained to the wall. These are the individuals that are inmates there. And here we have, we have uh, uh, ladies, uh, fancy ladies, walking through and observing. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Let's go to an asylum and watch all the wacko people. This sounds great. Anyway, so it was like going to the zoo, as strange as that may seem. Uh, isn't this horrible? Don't worry, it gets better. <laughs> uh, after the French Revolution, a guy by the name of Philippe, Philippe Pinel uh, convinced people that, uh, that convinced the, the uh, a country of France that they needed to unchain all the people, unchain all the people in the asylums. Uh, before that, in the 15th century, a, a German physician by the name of Johann Weyer uh, dared to argue with the church beliefs and propose that mental illness was a, was a psychopathology, that it was caused by an illness of the mind. And this is the first time they ever, anybody thought about this kind of stuff. Before that, they thought it was demons and witches that were causing all these people to be whacked out. But it was Bayer that said, no, I, he's, he argued with the church. So what happens to you when you argue with the church? <clears throat> Whoops. Yeah. He got executed. That's okay. But, of course, then the French took over the, uh, the French Revolution. The monarchy was kicked out. The monarchy, of course, part of their power was by, by uh, connecting themselves with the church. But after the French Revolution, uh, the people controlled uh, France, and uh, they kind of kicked the church out. They're still But they kind of, the, the church was controlling things. But after the French Revolution, they weren't controlling things. So Philippe Pinel said, let's, let's unchain the, uh, the people in the asylums. And that was the first time anybody came up with that idea. Uh, they became, they, they started uh, treating them more humanely. And these are some of the things that they did. I know it looks ugly and it looks horrible, but this is much, much better than, than what was going on before. Uh, if you've ever been around somebody that, that bangs their head on the wall or bangs their head, what are you going to do with them? Well, one of the things you can do with them is put them in a chair, strap them down, and uh, control their head movement. And that's what they did. That's one of the things that they did. Anyway. So they would strap them to chairs rather than chain them to the walls, as ugly as that seems. Okay, so now things are going to get better. Don't worry, things are going to get better. <clears throat> uh, reform of the treatment uh, in mental hospitals occurred three years after Pennell's reforms in England. Uh, so Pennell was, of course, in France. Uh, the Brits thought, well, hey, maybe this is not a bad idea. Uh, William Took, a uh, Quaker, uh, proposed more humane treatment for England's mentally ill in 17, uh, 1796. So Took decided that he was going to unchain the, the people in the asylums in England. And what he decided to do, he said, you know, we've got them in this really dirty, nasty place. Why don't we take them out into the country where it's really nice? We'll let them walk around. We'll let them talk to each other. And we'll especially pray, for, pray with them. He's a great word. Uh, and we'll have them do manual labor, and maybe this will actually fix them. And it worked. So he would have, he would take them out into the country, and they would let them walk around and talk to other people. And of course, he would pray with them uh, at night, and uh, he would let them uh, work in the garden or do other manual labor. And it actually helped the people. It helped the people that were in the, the asylum. Okay, that's England. So France has, has revised their, their asylums 
and England has revised their uh, asylum. So what happened in the United States? Well, we're Americans, and if it costs money, then we don't like it. That's kind of a tragedy, I know. Uh, so it took 50 years for us to decide that we were going to try to change things. Uh, the first individual to come up with the idea was Doroth Dorothea Dix. Uh, and she only changed things in Massachusetts initially. Uh, she got the, the Massachusetts legislature to come up with the cash uh, to allow women uh, in the, uh, the asylums uh, to be released from their chains. We were treating people just like they treated people before the reforms in uh, France and England until the, the 1830s and 1840s. And she finally changed one place, but, but by uh, petitioning other states, she got them to, to close their asylums as well. And she was able to get them to, to, to change in 38 different states. Each state in the Union controls their own mental health. And she, initially she uh, was only able to uh, get Massachusetts to change, but before she died, she was able to get 38 different states to unchain the uh, people in the asylums. How about Arizona? Well, Arizona wasn't a state. For them. This is uh, during the Civil War. She also got the uh, federal government to build a uh, hospital, a national asylum, St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. I've been there, not as an inmate, <laughs> it's really kind of an interesting place. It's, it's huge. Like Washington, D.C. is this tiny little place, but right in the middle of it is this chunk of, of, uh, of uh, the hospital, St. Elizabeth's Hospital. And it's like you know, 15 acres. It's really kind of bizarre. Anyway, and I've been there actually. For a while, they only had one guy in there, and they just released him a couple of years ago. It's a guy that shot Ronald Reagan, was the only guy that was in there. That was kind of weird. So, you know, I'm going up to the gate and it's like falling on its side. It was really kind of bizarre. But I had a friend that, I had a friend that lived right inside St. Elizabeth's. And when I took him home one night, uh, I, I went over there and looked around. It's kind of, kind of cool. There's nobody there. I mean, there's nobody there. It's really kind of strange. Anyway, okay. Uh, how much time do I have? How am I doing? Okay, got lots of time. Uh, with more, uh, a more enlightened idea of mental illness, doctors and scientists began looking at why mental illness occurred. Uh, Emil Kraepelin uh, of Germany, uh, and one of the things we're going to notice is a, a lot of the uh, individuals dealing with psychology are either German or Austrian. They speak German. So the first language of psychology turns out to be German or Latin. It's not English, of course. It's uh, German or Latin. So a lot of our ideas about psychology come out of Germany, or they come out of Austria, but they come to us from uh, the German language. Emil Kraepelin of Germany came up with the idea that mental dysfunction was caused by physical factors, such as fatigue. So when you're tired, sometimes you act erratically. You don't act right. Or you think that you need to fix yourself. So how do you do that? Well, you get drunk and than act erratically <coughs> once again. Biological discoveries supported the somatogenic perspective. Somatogenic means, soma means body, and genic means from. So somatogenic means from the body. So it came from the body, or it's manufactured from, manufactured from, or produced by. So somatogenic means from the body, as exciting as that is. So anytime you see soma, it means body. It's Latin. All it is is Latin for body. So somatogenic is from the body. And geni means produced from. Uh, one of the major factors of mental illness at the time was general paresis caused by syphilis. Uh, one of the things that happened uh, in, in Europe was that people had sex. I apologize for that. It's not my fault. And some people were infected with syphilis. And they infected their spouses. There were a lot of wealthy people, and these guys had sex with their mistresses. Or they would go and visit prostitutes, and then they would pick up syphilis. And then they would take it home and give it to their wives. And they didn't like that much, but sometimes they, they had sex with her anyway. As sad as all this stuff is. So there was a lot of syphilis in Europe. As a matter of fact, if you understand, do you know who Winston Churchill was? The, the Prime Minister of England during World War II? Both of his parents died of syphilis. His father picked it up, and he gave it to his mother. 
And both of his parents died of syphilis. Ah, we can treat syphilis now, but you have to treat it before it gets to a certain point. If you wait until it gets to, to uh, a certain point, then there's, no, there's nothing we can do about it. We can give you all the antibiotics in the world, it's not going to work. And if that happens, there is a uh, neurological problem that occurs. Uh, the vertebrae, vertebra in your neck fuse, so your neck is really stiff. Uh, you have headaches, but they're not too bad. You start acting cr uh, erratically. So you, it seems like you're crazy, but of course you're actually infected with syphilis. And this is known as paresis when this happens. As medical people, of course, now we can treat it. We've been able to treat syphilis uh, since we invented uh, penicillin. Uh, however, when I first started in medicine back in the 1970s, there were still people who had gotten to the point of no return as far as syphilis is concerned. So I came in contact with people that had that actually were suffering from paresis. They're all dead now, don't worry about it. They have all di since died. Actually, when you have paresis, you're not infected anymore. In other words, if you have sex with somebody, you're not going to, to give them syphilis uh, because you're not infected anymore. Uh, but uh, if you treat them before uh, they get to this point, of course, you can cure syphilis. But if you don't, then they have paresis. Okay. And I actually saw people with paresis. Really kind of exciting. So when I first started in medicine, we used to talk about this stuff all the time. Syphilis was a really serious problem. It was a really serious problem with the guys that fought in World War II uh, because they had just invented penicillin and it wasn't <clears> easy to get a hold of. So a lot of these individuals came down with, with, with syphilis and they weren't treated soon enough. You know how guys are. They don't want to tell anybody they've got little sores on their pee pee or something. So uh, these guys weren't were telling people and they were they were uh, getting to the point of no return and then they suffered from syphilis. Anyway, uh, syphilis is caused by a bacteria called uh, Treponema pallidum. It's a corkscrew-shaped bacteria. You hardly ever see corkscrew-shaped uh, bacteria in, in anything. They're almost all big balls or they're rod-shaped. Rods and cocci. Cocci, that means ball. But if you like, uh, if you if you look at uh, uh, Staph aureus or Beta strep, the, the strep that causes strep throat, they're all shaped like uh, balls, like little balls or cocci. But Treponema pallidum is corkscrew shape. I know it's really bizarre, <laughs> and for that reason, it's very difficult to detect. Uh, it's really hard to. Uh, we we do have tests for it now, of course, but uh, when I first started in in uh, medicine, uh, we just, yeah, there it is. Isn't that cool? It's so cool. <laughs> I know, I know, everything else looks like a little ball or a little rod. They're, they're so boring. I mean, you know, you look at, you take a skin scraping of the inside of your mouth and you look at it and everything's a ball or a rod. And then you've got syphilis and it's corkscrew shape. And you go, oh, you get all excited because you've seen something that's different. <laughs> medicine is boring most of the time. Most people aren't really sick. I mean, you, know, you, you hope that somebody comes in that's really sick. So you get to do something. You see something. Anyway. And of course the bacteria, if you, you don't get it before it uh, uh, gets to the point of no return, it causes insanity. Crablin linked mania excited elated reactions with depression to form the manic depressive category because the psychiatric records demonstrated the following. And this is one of the problems. Uh, they were used to people that acted the same way all the time. If you're depressed, you're depressed all the time. If you're uh, uh, manic, you're manic all the time. But here he had people that sometimes they were manic and sometimes they were depressed. And nobody had a, a diagnosis. They couldn't diagnose those things. But he's the one that came up with the diagnosis of manic depression. Craig, uh, he knew Kind of cool. The symptoms sometimes alternated with each other in the same person. Uh, both mania and melancholia showed an abrupt onset of periodic course in which the person tended to show spontaneous recovery, but a high likelihood of future reoccurrences. So if you had somebody that sometimes they were depressed and sometimes they were erratic, uh, they were uh, manic, uh, 
then he diagnosed them as being manic depressive, and he knew that at some point they were going to have another episode. And that's the way it works with manic depression. Now we call it bipolar disorder. We change the name. In neither case was there a progressive mental deterioration or physical symptoms such as paralysis. With paresis, we had paralysis. With schizophrenia, we had degeneration of the mental capacity. So schizophrenia was one thing, but bipolar disorder was something totally different. I'm sorry, manic depression was something totally different. And because he was able to give it a name, now all of a sudden we were able to talk about what was going on with people. Before, we were going, I don't know what he is. I thought he was depressed. But now he's acting like a wacko. I wonder what's going to happen next. And he, of course, gave it a diagnosis. And suddenly, we were able to treat these people. Or we, we were able to deal with these people. We didn't let them out of the asylum just because they acted normally today. Because tomorrow afternoon, they may have a depressive episode or a manic episode. The reality is, they normally had a manic episode before they had a depressive episode. Anyway, so Kraepelin came up with this idea. Kraepelin uh, created dementia praecox based on the symptoms which had two common characteristics. Dementia praecox eventually became schizophrenia. And this is, this is the reason he called it dementia praecox. It had an early onset, so it was precocious. And that's what praecox means. It has a progressive downhill uh, cause uh, toward an incurable dementia. And that's the way schizophrenia works. If somebody is suffering from schizophrenia, they're not going to get any better. They're not going to get any smarter. It's going to, go, uh, it's going to uh, degenerate until they get to the point of dementia. And that's uh, dementia precox. Precocious dementia. While irreversible, the outcome was not death, but rather st stabilized stabilization at a reduced level of mental and social capacity. Okay, so now they have... Now we can diagnose them with schizophrenia. He's given it a name. And once he gives it a name, now we can identify other individuals with the same problem. And if we can come up with a, any kind of treatment, then those individuals can get that treatment, as exciting as that is. Kraepelin's two major classifications accounted for about two-thirds of all the patients in mental hospitals at the time. Two-thirds. These major classifications establish the possibility that categories of mental disorders reflected distinct disease processes. So now we started looking for what causes schizophrenia. I'm sorry, dementia precox. What causes manic depression? There must be a reason. We know that paresis is caused by syphilis, treponema pallidia. So now we can start looking for a cause. Before, what did we do with them? We had no way of knowing, we had no way of putting all these people together. So we have somebody in New York City looking at them and going, uh, uh, and somebody in San Francisco is going, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what we should do. But if we get these two guys together and they can start talking, and talking about dementia precox, and talking about manic depression, and all of a sudden there's a possibility that we can actually cure the disease. Because it may be just like syphilis, as exciting as that is. Anyway, and that's what happened. <laughs> uh, people in middle hospitals welcomed the biological theories because it meant that there was more likely to be medical solutions to mental problems. And it looked like it, we might have a handle on this thing. And before, they were just throwing people in the dungeon and leaving them, chaining them to the wall. We had nothing to do. We had no way to fix them. We couldn't put things together. We couldn't look at a medication and see if it worked. But now, all of a sudden, with a biological model, we could put all this stuff together. We knew that treponema pallidium caused uh, syphilis, and syphilis caused paresis, so maybe there was actually a biological cause for schizophrenia, and what became schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Physicians tried tooth extractions, tonsillectomies, hydrotherapy, uh, lobotomies to cure mental problems, and some of these things worked. Sometimes we could pull a, a, a somebody's sore tooth, and all of a sudden, their schizophrenia went away. Really? How exciting is that? There was a. I'm going to, I'm going to use the word masturbation. I hope nobody's offended. But once upon a time, there was a guy that used to masturbate all the time. 
He was in the Indiana prison. The, uh, he was in the Indiana State Prison, and this guy used to masturbate all the time. And he told, he told the doctor, if I could stop masturbating, then I could, I could do stuff because that's all I do is masturbate. And so the doctor decided he was going to try different things to keep him from masturbating and uh, different physical things. Uh, so he, he did all kinds of interesting things. He made a cut across, across his stomach. Uh, he said, uh, here, rub this. Uh, when you feel like masturbating, well, that didn't work because he just got infected and it didn't work. Uh, but then he did, uh, eventually he did, he gave him a vasectomy. He went in there and he cut his lost deference. And guess what happened next? He stopped masturbating. There's no reason why he should. But we were looking, at least we were looking for cures. It's one of those bizarre things that has happened in the past. And that's where the vasectomy uh, surgery came from. From this guy trying to cure masturbation, as odd as that sounds. So we tried all kinds of different things, and sometimes they worked. But it, was only, it only worked because we were paying attention to it. It was what we call the uh, Hawthorne effect. The more you pay attention to something, the more likely it will cure itself. Anyway, so they tried all kinds of things, and some of them worked. They tried electroshock, and surprisingly, it worked. It wasn't until the 1950s that effective medications were discovered to treat mental, mental patients, and the biological perspective actually began paying dividends. So we were looking for medications. We were throwing drugs at these people. Some of them we were poisoning and killing. But it wasn't until the 1950s that we finally came up with something that actually worked, as exciting as that is. We were looking for a cure for schizophrenia, and it didn't work. But it did work on depression. I know, that's where, that's where tricyclics came from. I know, they were looking for, for a cure, they were looking for a cure for tuberculosis, and they came up with a cure for schizophrenia. It didn't work on tuberculosis, but it did work on schizophrenia. And that was in the 1950s. So we started, started all this uh, pharmaceutical research. And from that, of course, we started being able to cure people, as exciting as all that is. But sometimes we, it was just, uh, uh, what's that word I'm doing? It was just a happenstance. You know, you, you pay attention to this guy, you do something for him, and all of a sudden it fixes him. There you go. There's a word for that. Anyway. We'll, we'll stop right here and we'll pick this up next time. Sorry about this, this story about...